Welcome, and thank you for attending Baker Hostetler's Class Action Defense 2023 Fall Review. This is a one hour and 15 minute presentation. We'll do our best to answer your questions during the presentation, which you may enter through the chat function. For questions we do not get to answer during the program, we will follow up after the program. I am Julie Brady, co-leader of Baker Hostetler's Class Action Defense Team. In addition to myself, the presenters today include my co-leader, Bethany Lukic, as well as Baker Hostetler partners, Carl Fanter, Ali Hawk, and Casey Klignan. We'll be discussing the significant cases and matters in the class action space over the course of 2023 and offer our predictions for the remainder of the year. The program will focus on the following areas, advertising and consumer product class actions, financial services class actions, insurance class actions, privacy and digital risk class actions, and then an appellate update. Before we begin, I'd like to take a minute to go over a few housekeeping matters. This program is approved for CLE for 75 minutes in California, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, New Jersey, New York, Texas, and Washington. CLE in Ohio is pending. During the program, we will share two CLE codes, which you will need to write down and enter in a post webinar survey in order to receive CLE credit. You should see the first code now. If that doesn't put you in the mood for fall. The post webinar survey will begin immediately following this presentation. So there is nothing you will need to do to start it. If for any reason you have any trouble, please email cblaine at bakerlaw.com for a PDF of the survey. And now my co-leader of Baker Hostetler's class action defense team will provide a fall recap on advertising and consumer product class actions. Bethany? Thanks, Julie. Um, welcome. Uh, next slide, Cassie. So I'm going to cover five areas or five trends that we're seeing in advertising and consumer product class actions. Many of these we've touched on in prior uh, webinars, and I'll be providing an update in those areas. First area is going to be dealing with labeling. Does the full label count, the front and the back? Um, second topic is standing cases. Um, there have been a lot of dismissals for lack of standing, lack of injury in this space. Third topic is origin cases. Fourth topic is a continuation on our discussion of greenwashing cases. And finally, I'm going to end with an update on PFAS litigation. Next slide. So the first topic I'm gonna to cover is, does the information on the back of the label count? And here we're gonna talk about two uh, recent decisions coming out of the Ninth Circuit the McGinty case and the Steinberg case. The McGinty case um, is a great case for defendants. And it really goes to show that you don't have to discard the back of the label in your analysis as to whether the wording on the front of the label is potentially deceptive or whether plaintiff has made a um, a plausible cause of action based on the language on the front of the label. And this particular case involved labeling of natural fusion shampoo and conditioner products. In this case, the Ninth Circuit affirmed that it is not circuit precedent that you have to discard the back of the label. Instead, the Ninth Circuit clarified that if the language of the front of the label could be seen as ambiguous or said differently, if the language on the front of the label is clearly misleading, then you don't get to consider the back of the package. But if it is ambiguous and it could be read in multiple different ways, then you can include the language on the back of the package to determine whether or not plaintiff has made a misrepresentation case. There are a couple of other points um, in this case that I think are helpful. One of them is a discussion of consumer surveys and whether consumer surveys are helpful and can be considered by a court in the analysis 
or should be disregarded by the court. And here, the court disregarded the specific consumer survey that was performed. In doing so, it basically held that the consumer survey was not helpful because uh, the consumers were only shown the front of the label. And here, they didn't get to see the back of the label, which the court found helpful in determining whether a reasonable person would be misled by the phrase natural fusion. And finally, I'd like to point out that there is a discussion in the concurrence of this case regarding greenwashing claims that um, the court held that while this case didn't involve egregious examples of greenwashing, um, that the that there is a tendency to um, go into this space of greenwashing when using phrases such as natural and imagery. Here, there was an image of an avocado and green imagery on the product. And so the court warned that this case was close to um, a greenwashing case, although it didn't arise to that level. Um, the second case also is a um, another Ninth Circuit case. That decision is very short and sweet, but basically says the same thing, that here this in this origin case, the court didn't need to disregard the fact that the product clearly indicated that it was manufactured in New York when it had the term Icelandic in the name of the product. Next slide. And as I mentioned, there have been quite a few standing cases dealing with labeling claims. Um, I'd like to point out, first of all, that it's nice to see some cases outside of New York and California and Illinois, which is where we see the large majority of um, food labeling cases. These cases happen to come in Florida, both of them in the Southern District of Florida. Um, the first case dealt with honey lozenges, um, and the allegation there was that the imagery, which included um, honey and lemon, um, was misleading in, to the consumer because the consumer reasonably would have expected that there would have been a de minimis amount of lemon ingredients in the product. Um, the court here found that um, plaintiff didn't have standing to sue. One of the reasons plaintiff didn't have standing to sue is that Publix had a money back guarantee that was written on the product. In other words, if the consumer was unhappy with the product, they could return the product for whatever reason and get their money back. Here, plaintiff hadn't alleged any injury outside of the fact that um, you know, they purchased the product and paid money for the product. And so the court found that they hadn't availed themselves of this um, refund and couldn't bring um, a case back based on lack of standing. But even if the court didn't consider this refund policy, the court also held that just alleging a generic price premium allegation wasn't sufficient to confer standing. Here, plaintiff had purchased the cough drops, had used the cough drops, um, basically didn't plead that the cough drops didn't work or that they were valueless, that they didn't um, work as advertised. And therefore, the court held that for this reason also, plaintiff didn't have standing. And the court also examined the fact that plaintiff continued to purchase the product. So not only did they purchase the product once, but they purchased the product multiple times, which gave the court sufficient inferences that they were happy with the product. The second case, again, dealing with um, allegations that the craft macaroni and cheese single serve cups um, plaintiff alleged couldn't be made in three and a half minutes and the three and a half minutes was deceptive labeling and therefore they paid a price premium. Um, again, here the court looked at plaintiff's allegations that she continued to purchase the product despite the fact that she quote unquote knew of this mislabeling. 
And so plaintiff was not able to allege that the product was worthless. The court criticized plaintiffs for not even suggesting that she tried to cook the product in three and a half minutes and it didn't work. And the court dismissed the case for lack of standing. Next slide. Our third topic is origin cases. So many products um, have a state name, a location name in them that might be part of their brand name. It might be part of their imagery. And the courts are examining, there are a number of cases out there saying, is this imagery, is it use of a um, city, a state, a location as part of your brand misleading? Would it mislead a reasonable consumer to think that your product was manufactured in the location that the name um, in the advertising or in your product um, is it exists? So the first case deals with Popcorn Indiana is the name of the product. Um, in this particular case, there was nothing on the product that indicated that the popcorn was manufactured in Illinois. The corn itself was from Indiana, but plaintiffs alleged that they believed based on the name Popcorn Indiana, that the popcorn was not only grown, the corn wasn't grown in Indiana, but it was also manufactured there. And they filed a putative class action. Here again, the court um, dismissed the on, on standing grounds. Um, there was lack of standing to pursue injunctive relief because again, once you realize that the product isn't manufactured in the place that you think it is, there is no ongoing harm. But importantly here, the court found that plaintiff hadn't alleged the requisite knowledge for the various different fraudulent claims that were alleged here. And here they didn't plead that the company intended to deceive consumers or knew that they were deceiving consumers by um, not including the place of manufacture or by including the name Indiana in the brand name. The second case um, is also a great origin case for defendants. And this case was a cosmetics case brought against L'Oreal. Um, here, plaintiffs were alleging that the use of the name Paris, which is part of the brand name, and certain French language text that occurred on some of the products was misleading to plaintiff in that she believed that the products were manufactured in France and therefore paid a price premium. Um, again, here, the court found that just the word Paris was not misleading to a reasonable consumer. And again, the court looked at all of the packaging in context and um, determined that, you know, using the word Paris, when Paris is the founding place of L'Oreal, where its originating headquarters wouldn't mislead a reasonable consumer to um, believe that every product is manufactured in France. And they, along with the front label, back label discussion that we had earlier, the court found that the front label is not so misleading that a reasonable consumer who cared about the country of manufacture should not be expected to look at the full packaging for disclaimer, which was clearly and correctly provided on the labels of each product purchased. So again, you don't have to ignore common sense. You should be able to use the entirety of the label. This case also has a discussion of consumer surveys again and criticized plaintiff's counsel here and said, basically, even if you were to add the survey that you claim you performed, that wouldn't be, um, adding that survey would be futile and not helpful because again, the consumers were not shown both the front and the back of the packaging. Next. So we're gonna turn now to green class actions and green washing class actions. I have three cases on this slide. Two of the cases are cases to watch. 
Um, we see all sorts of different greenwashing claims in the courts, and they're sort of percolating through. Um, these cases, again, are very factually based, um, depending on the specific claims that are made, the packaging, what does the packaging look like, and whether or not the um, representations are qualified or unqualified. And the H&M case is a good decision for defendants out of the Eastern District of Missouri. It's a good case to look at, you know, what is claimed versus what do plaintiffs claim that those um, statements mean. And here, this case involved the conscious choice collection. And plaintiffs alleged that they thought that this meant that the um, clothing was more environmentally friendly and more sustainable, even though none of H&M's specific express language used that environmentally friendly or more sustainable language. And the court um, cautioned plaintiffs that they need to be careful about continuously using this term environmentally friendly when the packaging and the labeling clearly didn't suggest that they were saying that conscious choice meant environmentally um, uh, friendly. So this court uh, dismissed these claims on a motion to dismiss. Um, just a note here that we're still waiting on official updates to the green guides from the FTC. The rulemaking and rule um, comment period has closed for suggestions as to how to update the green guides, but we don't have official updates to those green guides yet. And lastly, I'm going to close with a discussion of PFAS litigation. Next slide. Uh, PFAS litigation is still very, very active um, in, in the U.S. Um, we're still seeing cases. I saw one filed last night against an orange juice manufacturer for inclusion of PFAS in the packaging. So these cases are still um, coming out. They're, they're uh, very interesting to watch. Um, we do have one decision out relating to bare minerals products, uh, cosmetics, that here the court dismissed the case because plaintiff hadn't pled that either the PFAS was so widespread across all of the different products that the product she purchased was likely to contain PFAS or that she tested the product that she herself had purchased to suggest that she plausibly had standing to pursue the claims. And finally, the case um, is one of the big cases from a class action perspective that is currently up on appeal, we've spoken about it, is the Hardwick case. Um, this is a class action that would essentially cover all Ohioans and here the court, Judge Sargas, certified a class that he considered to be injunctive relief, which essentially ordered defendants to perform a study as to whether or not um, uh, PFAS adversely affected humans. So basically a mon medical monitoring type of study. And here the Sixth Circuit took this case up on appeal. It has been fully briefed. And just a note that oral argument is scheduled for October 19th. So if you're interested in that oral argument, it will certainly be interesting and we'll be reporting on that case in the future. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carl to talk about financial class actions. Thanks, Bethany. Uh, I help lead Baker's financial services industry team. I sit in Baker's Cleveland office, and I'm happy to be presenting here today. First, I'm going to analyze the CFPB case currently in the Supreme Court, which impacts not just class actions, but the entire financial services industry. Second, I'm going to talk about some recent class action decisions. And finally, I'm going to touch upon how the CFPB's recent regulatory activity may impact class actions going forward. The lawsuit against the CFPB concerns a trade association representing payday lenders who challenged the CFPB's rules. The district court granted summary judgment to the CFPB, but last fall, 
a Fifth Circuit panel reversed, holding that the CFPB's funding structure is unconstitutional because it violates the Appropriations Clause. Congress, in the 2010 Dodd-Frank Act, determined that the CFPB would be financed through the Federal Reserve to protect the agency from political interference. The panel, however, did a detailed analysis, even cited the Federalist Papers, about Congress's power over the federal purse. The panel was concerned about the CFPB receiving funding from the Fed, which is itself outside of Congress's appropriations process. The panel characterized the CFPB's funding as a double insulation from Congress's purse strings. So because the funding used by the CFPB was unconstitutional, the court vacated the agency's rules. Next, rather than seek further review in the Fifth Circuit, the CFPB quickly moved for cert in the Supreme Court. The CFPB, of course, argued other circuits have rejected the Fifth Circuit's reasoning, and more importantly, the prior jurisprudence about the Appropriations Clause doesn't support the Fifth Circuit's decision. Next. The argument will be in a few weeks, right at the start of the court's term. Should the court rule that the CFPB's funding structure is unconstitutional, but stay its decision to give Congress time to change the CFB, CFPB's funding, which a few of the amici have suggested. That contentious political process may happen uh, during a presidential election year. Next. The decision calls into question not only the CFPB's funding, but arguably the constitutionality of other banking agencies like the OCC and the FDIC, as some of those agencies are also insulated from the traditional appropriations process of Congress. The CFPB has rules and regulations that touch on many industries, credit cards, mortgages, auto loans, debt collection, credit reporting, and others. Those businesses not having predictability regarding the rules of the road from their regulators could disrupt those industries. For example, if the CFPB's mortgage rules were vacated, then companies who issue and modify disclosures would have to do that for millions of consumers right away. And just last week, the head of the CFPB gave a speech that the case could have significant destabilizing, that was the word he used, implications for the entire housing and financial regulatory system. Next. Now I'd like to turn to some recent key class action decisions. In CESA, the plaintiff alleged that the defendants improperly reported a balloon payment for a car, car lease as a debt on her credit report. She alleged that TransUnion violated the FICRA requirement for a consumer reporting agency to follow reasonable procedures to assure the maximum possible accuracy of the report's information. The CFPB and the FTC filed amicus briefs in support of the plaintiff. So while the court tried to narrow its holding, ultimately the Second Circuit rejected the district court's holding that legal disputes were not subject to FICRA's inaccuracy standard. So now, arguably legal inaccuracies could trigger FICRA liability. In Carpenter, uh, it's one of several so-called true lender class actions that have been filed around the country. In Carpenter, the plaintiff, the plaintiff claims that the fintech defendant is the true lender on loans with interest rates higher than state law. And, and the fintech defendant's out-of-state partner, who is chartered from a state with higher permissible interest rates, is not actually the appropriate lender. As in other cases, the defendant moved to compel individual arbitration. But unlike in prior cases, here the district court found that the clause was unconscionable and declined to enforce it. The case has been appealed to the Ninth Circuit, and we'll be watching to see how the appeal develops, since this impacts not only fintech partnerships with established banks, but also the enforceability of arbitration clauses and electronic click-through screens. Next. Now I'd like to turn to how courts are analyzing standing in class actions in light of transunion. Now, in TransUnion, the Supreme Court narrowed a class action based on violations of FICRA. The plaintiff, Mr. Ramirez, tried to buy a car. The dealership ran a credit check with TransUnion, which wrongly suggested that Mr. Ramirez was on a terrorist watch list. The jury sided with Mr. Ramirez and awarded the class $60 million, which the Ninth Circuit reduced to $40 million. Next. By a slim 5-4 vote, 
the Supreme Court ruled that the 1,800 people whose personal information was actually sent to a third party, like a car dealership, had the Article III standing to sue. But the 6,000 other people whose information was not actually disclosed did not have standing. Uh, the, the holding of Justice Kavanaugh's majority decision is essentially no concrete harm, no standing. The court made clear that even when Congress has provided a federal cause of action, the mere fact that the law has been violated will not, standing alone, provide a right to sue in federal court. The majority stated that the 6,000 or so class members whose information was not sent to a third party didn't suffer an injury in fact for standing purposes. In other words, the inaccurate information that never saw the light of day from TransUnion is not a sufficient concrete harm for a FICRA violation. Next. So what are some key takeaways? First, each claim and form of relief requires separate standing to sue. Each class member must also have standing. The decision widened the door for standing-based challenges to class actions. Second, proving injury in fact or a concrete injury for statutory claims will require comparing the alleged harms covered by the statute to existing common law claims. And third, while the risk of future harm may be sufficient for standing for injunctive relief, that harm may not be sufficient for a damages claim. Next. So how have circuit courts been interpreting TransUnion recently? In Hunstein, the 11th Circuit in an en banc decision applied TransUnion to alleged violations of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. The court held that there was no standing for the entire class. Following TransUnion, the court rejected Hunstein's claim that his suffered harm arising when the defendant debt collector sent information about the debt to a third party letter vendor was similar to the common law tort of public disclosure of private facts. The court stated that even if the vendor's employees saw the plaintiff's information, disclosing information to private individuals is not the same as publicly disclosing facts, which is the, the common law analog. Next. Similarly, the Fifth Circuit in Perez held that simply sending a letter to collect a time-barred debt, even if that itself violates the FDCPA, is insufficient to show injury for Article III standing. And in Maddox, the Second Circuit dismissed a lawsuit based on a state law giving a private right of action to an individual for a bank failing to record her mortgage satisfaction in a timely fashion with the county recorder. Like the class members in TransUnion, the Maddox court observed that the plaintiff did not have a claim because there was no evidence that a misleading record was ever read by anyone. So the court reasoned, again, there was no concrete injury for Article III standing. Next. And again, folks are still grappling you know, with this throughout the country. Just this summer, Rayleigh and Freeman decided in different circuits just a month apart, show the continued difference of application of transunion and consumer finance class actions. On the whole, however, the reality is that challenging Article III standing for statutory consumer finance class actions uh, is a stronger tool for defendants than it was a year or two ago based on the development of law throughout the country. Next. So finally, there's often an increase in consumer class actions for areas of emphasis for exams and enforcement of banks and related supervised entities. And in January of 2023, the CFPB proposed a rule to establish a public registry of supervised non-bank terms and conditions in form contracts that claim to waive or limit consumer rights or protections, like bankruptcy rights, liability amounts, or even class action waivers. That information will be posted based on the proposed rule in a public registry so that class action plaintiff's lawyers would have access to a registry of form contract language for businesses. Some observers believe that this may increase the likelihood for future consumer class actions being filed, and I agree with that view. And just this July, the CFPB highlighted various unfair and deceptive practices that it had recently identified during its supervisory exams in several areas and lines of business. For example, for auto financing, examiners found issues with deceptive marketing, 
charging interest on inflated loan balances and canceling automatic payments without notice. So, so what does all that mean? What does all that increased regulatory activity mean? I think it means that we're going to see an increase in consumer finance class actions at the uh, end of 2023 here, as well as into 2024, particularly as they relate to fee and disclosure issues. So thank you all for your time. And now I'm going to pass it to Ali to discuss recent developments in insurance class actions. Thanks, Carl. And my name is Ali Hawk, and I'll be uh, talking about insurance class actions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and following up on, on what Carl just ended with, I'm going to focus um, almost entirely on standing in the insurance um, class action context. And, you know, the key theme to keep in mind here is whether and to what extent these Article Three standing rules actually differ from existing class certification requirements under Rule 23. Next slide, please. We'll start with the standing implications for situations where a named plaintiff brings uh, claims on behalf of individuals in multiple states. This has been happening with increased frequency in so-called labor depreciation class actions. These are property, um, uh, property insurance class actions about how to depreciate the cost of replacing damaged property. Um, it occurs when an insurer calculates uh, the replacement cost. It typically includes in the cost of materials necessary to replace the property. So for example, shingles on a roof, uh, as well as the cost, um, the labor cost to make the replacement itself. The legal question is whether depreciation should only be applied to the material component or to both materials and labor. The issue is fundamentally one of state common law and, and various different jurisdictions have reached different rules, but plaintiffs continue to bring class actions that include states where the issue is undecided by the state's highest court. Next slide, please. I'm going to focus on two recent opinions in these types of cases um, where courts held that the named plaintiffs lack Article III standing to assert claims on behalf of insureds in other states because they did not suffer an injury under those states' um, laws. Note, these aren't holdings under um, Rule uh, 23B3's uh, predominance requirement. The, the issue isn't that a class action would be unmanageable or that legal um, variation destroyed predominance. The holdings are that the named plaintiffs lack um, Article III standing to pursue such claims altogether. Next slide, please. That distinction can be important because it gives defendants an opportunity to address a multi-state uh, class early in the case before cross-jurisdictional discovery. It also shifts the applicable burden of proof for an early stage effort to strike uh, class allegations. Typically, defendants face an uphill battle on a motion to strike, but Article III standing is a jurisdictional requirement, and plaintiffs bear the burden of proving federal jurisdiction uh, for the class. And as we know, Article III standing gets the attention of courts in a way that motions to strike ordinarily may not. Next slide, please. Now, this case law comes as a surprise to many because we're familiar with multi-state class actions. So what sets these, case, uh, these cases apart? It's not clear why um, this should matter for Article III purposes, but the distinguishing feature here uh, may be the developed body of differing laws on the, on the underlying legal question uh, involving uh, insurance uh, issues. At any rate, uh, we've seen similar motions filed in multiple different labor depreciation class actions, so we're likely to see more development on this pretty soon. Next slide. The next issue involves a, a different standing question, uh, which asks how similar the named plaintiff's injuries are to the injuries of absent class members. The question looks a lot like Rule 23A3's typicality um, requirement, but in two recent opinions, the Fifth Circuit has analyzed the issue through the lens of Article 3. Next slide. The first case is a so-called tax and fee class action. Um, the, the insurance contracts in these cases typically require the insurer to pay the quote, actual cash value of a total automobile. And the parties dispute whether the ACV includes certain taxes and fees um, one would have to pay to purchase a replacement vehicle. But in this particular uh, case is the uh, Angel um, versus Geico case, the named plaintiffs did not actually have to pay all the fees um, at issue when they purchased the replacement vehicle. So the question was whether the named plaintiff had standing to assert claims for recovery of such fees for other class members who did actually pay those fees. Uh, next slide. 
The Fifth Circuit and Angel looked at various um, uh, approaches to this question and drew a distinction between a class certification uh, approach and a standing approach. The class certification approach only looked to the named plaintiff's Article III standing and assessed any other questions about the similarity of injuries under Rule 23. But cases applying the standing approach um, apply an additional inquiry, which asks whether the named plaintiff's injuries were sufficiently analogous to those suffered by the rest of the class. Next slide. The Angel Court uh, ultimately didn't resolve which approach was correct. It just held that the claims um, in that particular case uh, before it satisfied both approaches. Uh, according to the court, even though the name plaintiffs weren't requesting the same types of fees as everyone in the in the class, the injury was the breach of the contract's payment provisions, and that injury was the same for every class member. Next slide, please. But just last month, the Fifth Circuit returned to this issue in another case that might provide more questions, frankly, than, than answers. In Chavez, the court built off its analysis in the Angel case by identifying further nuances to the, the standing approach. The court identified different formulations of the standing approach under language from prior Supreme Court cases. Um, this is the, the Lewis and the Gratz cases that are um, shown here in the slide, uh, as well as uh, ways that other circuits have approached the similarity of injury question under Article III. But after cataloging um, all of this, the court again declined to pick a test, finding that any of the approaches would be satisfied. Next slide, please. So one of the uh, key questions uh, moving forward is how this Article Three question differs from the eventual commonality and typicality questions that, the, uh, that courts must assess under Rule 23. The Fifth Circuit did not provide clear answers on this, but we'll likely see more law developing um, as more litigants attempt to use Article Three to attack class certification. Next slide. The last issue is what we call standing as predominance. Um, the question is this, when individualized inquiries would be required to determine which class members suffered an injury in fact for standing, does that raise Article Three problems, predominance problems, or both? Next slide. The typical approach is to address this under Rule 23, um, and it, this is shown in a, a series of California life insurance cases decided this year. Uh, the cases involve a California statute that requires life insurers to notify policyholders of the right to designate a third party to receive notice pending termination of their policy for non-payment. Plaintiffs alleged that certain insurers fail to provide these notices. But four different cases this year denied class certification because individualized inquiries would be required to determine whether the alleged failure to provide notice actually caused any injury to the individual insured. For example, if an insured voluntarily terminated their uh, terminated their policy because they did not want to keep paying premiums, the insurer's failure to provide the notice would not have injured anyone. Next slide. But more and more often, we are seeing defendants argue that these kinds of issues also implicate Article Three, not just Rule Twenty Three. Uh, for example, in the case cited here, the Drummond v. Progressive case in, in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, uh, that case involved an auto um, insurance contract where the insurer was obligated to pay, again, the actual cash value of totaled um, automobiles. The plaintiffs alleged that the insurer was underpaying ACV by applying a particular adjustment when valuing the vehicles. The insurer responded that even when it did apply the adjustment, individualized inquiries would be required to determine which class members were paid less than the actual value of the vehicle. Next slide. The insurer also argued that this implicated Article 3 because according to the insurer, every class member must have suffered an injury to certify a class. There are class members who were, who were actually paid more than ACV. These class members were not injured and certification would not be appropriate. Initially, the district court agreed with the insurer's premise, even though TransUnion expressly reserved this issue. The court stated that every class member must have suffered an injury to certify a class. Next slide. But the district court ultimately determined that every class member did suffer an injury because according to the court, the use of the adjustment was the injury itself. Now, for reasons that we'll go into deeply, and, and I will not attribute this to my colleagues, but we think this analysis is, is wrong. Under these types of insurance contracts, the key measuring stick is whether the insurance payment was up above or below the actual value of the vehicle, uh, irrespective of the method um, the insurer uses to get that value. Next slide. 
The Drummond case is still interesting, though, um, because it accepts a premise that most other courts have rejected, um, that every class member must have suffered an injury, in fact, to certify a class. Most courts have rejected that concept. But whether or not Drummond is correct on that point, Article 3 still matters for predominance. Next slide. That's because individualized inquiries about who, uh, who has Article 3 standing should implicate Rule 23b3's uh, predominance requirement. Um, the 11th Circuit, there's uh, the Cordoba Direct TV case, um, first recognized this principle in 2019, um, which uh, uh, it, th I think this case was actually cited in the TransUnion uh, decision itself. Uh, while we haven't seen other circuit courts reject class certification on this basis, a recent Ninth Circuit case noted that individualized Article III inquiries could raise predominance concerns as well. The Ninth Circuit kicked kick the issue back to the district court to assess in the first instance, but its recognition of the principle might give new vitality to these types of arguments. Next slide. So why does it matter? Uh, why does it matter that whether Article III enters the predominance inquiry? The, the need to show individualized injury or causation only matters for Rule 23 if the underlying elements of the cause of action actually require such evidence. But Article 3 is implicated by any cause of action in federal court. So no matter what type of claim is brought, even statutory damages claims, individualized injury inquiries can be used to fight class certification. And I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Casey. Thanks, Ali. Really appreciate it. Um, my name is Casey Kalignan. I'm one of the leaders on the privacy class action team here at Baker Hostetler. I'm resident in the Denver office and want to talk today with you guys about, you know, the last six months that's going on in privacy and uh, digital risk class actions. Next slide, Cassie. So six trends I want to talk about today. The first one, data breach data breach class actions. One time you're going to hear me talk about this, that this trend is actually going away, but that day is not today. Metapixel class actions, happy to report that we've seen more wins than losses, so love that news. Um, SIPA class actions, they just keep on coming. Bethany and I keep waiting for them to kind of go away and die down, and we're not seeing it happen. Um, BIPA class actions are still hanging on. Some good news with VIPA class actions, they tend to be slowing down a little bit due to some key wins in the last six months, and I'll put those up on the slide. And then what's the next trend, right? Even though we not, aren't getting out of these current um, statutory trends, we want to talk about what's coming next. And so doxing may be the thing everybody's talking about next. Next slide. So again, the biggest trend in data breach class actions is that there just is no trend. I keep, you know, we in the defense bar just keep waiting for the district courts, the circuit courts to give us some consistent rulings on what is a damage? Just tell us yes or no right? What's going to be certifiable? Yes or no. And we just keep not getting those answers, which leads, which means this trend is going to go on for the foreseeable future. Everybody was tracking the Brinker appeal that came down um, in the first six months here in the 11th circuit. And it, you know, this was kind of a split the baby. It's interesting in recent mediations and in you know multiple rounds of briefing we've had since this Brinker opinion, both the defense and the plaintiff's bar are calling this a win, which just <laughs> emphasizes how much of a trend of uncertainty is still happening here. For instance, the 11th Circuit said all three of the plaintiffs have alleged a concrete and particularized injury in fact because they actually alleged a misuse, right? Credit card, payment card data was stolen in the incident, allegedly, and it was allegedly posted on the dark web. Right, the court said that's enough, and analyzing each individual plaintiff's um, claims. But then the court went on to find, but two of the named plaintiffs essentially failed to meet what's akin to a statute of limitations. Right, they they actually didn't visit Chili's during the appro appropriate window. So again, you know, the defense, the plaintiffs are taking this as a victory, but from the defense perspective, it's also a victory. If a court has to review the individualized injury and causation allegations of each individual class representative, how can you possibly certify a class? And my prediction is that the court just wasn't willing to pull the trigger yet, but we're not giving up, right? So I think the takeaway from this case is that the court said, hmm, I'm analyzing these things. There's enough there there, right? And I'm going to give the district court another opportunity to see if, if there is any way to formulate a class. So did the defense win? Not really. Did the plaintiffs win? Not really. So the uncertainty rolls on. Next slide, Cassie. 
So two other um, cases that popped up in 2023, which I think um, support this trend is the Marriott case. Everybody's watching it, bated breath, figuring out, is overpayment um, going to be a theory? Are these damage theories going to survive on class certification? And the Fourth Circuit said, nope, still no guidance for you guys out there, but let's go ahead and make sure that we do any sort of class waiver analysis first. And it's important to flag this because it's really untethered to an arbitration issue. It's a class action waiver in and of itself. So again, this ruling is not surprising, but once again, all of the key rich stuff we wanted the circuit courts to weigh in on, they just punted, right? So the good news, we have one case that's incredibly good news, and it's the Adias v. Care First case, and it's a healthcare data breach where the court, um, you know, this case has been a critical yo-yo, right? The district court originally denied or uh, granted the motion to dismiss based on lack of standing, the court of appeals reversed. Then the district court said, okay, that's fine. Now I'm going to dismiss based on lack of injury for um, rule 12b6 lack of injury, not standing. Okay, fine. I'm going to kick it because there's actually not an element of the claim of injury. Went back up to, you know, the court of appeals, that was affirmed. And now they're back down on class certification. And this court's like, I've been telling you guys, we're never going to certify this case. And indeed, the judge didn't certify the case. So we're hoping that this sticks. And I'm hoping that this trend carries forward. Although, you know, in recent mediations and briefing where we've used this ruling, what the plaintiffs say is this was a terrible judge, terrible facts, and is not precedential at all. Pretty convenient, I'd say. Go ahead, Cassie. The Metapixel litigation, I could talk about this obviously for a full 75 minutes, but for those of you that are new to the privacy space, the hot and heavy issue that has been percolating, I mean, probably for about a decade, but last year is when this trend really hit, where we've seen hundreds and hundreds of these cases challenging that anybody with a website that has the Metapixel application on it, basically sending information about your browsing history and experience back to Meta, right, violates privacy rights, statutes, all sorts of things. We saw this in the healthcare context where they both had it in front of the portal, which we call a user authenticated experience. Anytime a user has to actually authenticate themselves and log into the website, the argument is any tracking should stop there. So there's fights both over if you have it in front of the firewall and behind the firewall. Darned if you do, darned if you don't. But I'm really happy to report that the trends are winning clearly in the defense's favor. And I love this news. So on the right side of the slide, you can see here, and again, just a, you know, a quick plug for the firm, but we have over 77 of these cases just in the healthcare space alone, just to show how prolific this litigation is. And the good news, again, in uh, 2023, we've seen you know, at least three cases where they've been um, dismissed outright and a couple that are not quite ready to dismiss. So I'm not even calling the cases that are losses really losses, right? Because indeed, we just haven't won them yet. So our prediction is there's going to be a lot more summary judgment motions filed in the pixel space. And hopefully the settlements for the clients that believe that's in their best interest will have a more reasonable opportunity to settle because two, you know, of the biggest settlements that everybody's talking about on online, the Massachusetts General and the advocate case that are all over in the press, you know, are very, very high settlements. And we don't want that trend to continue. Cassie, please go ahead. Uh, SIPA, which, you know, Bethany Lukish on this call does a lot of, we just keep waiting for these to go away. And these cases just keep coming back. Just as a brief um, history, for those who are not familiar, what SIPA is, in 1967, California enacted a statute talking about what is electronic eavesdropping? Right. And again, that's kind of an archaic statute that likely was never intended to apply to the technological advances that we have today. But then the Ninth Circuit last year opened the floodgates. Right. It does apply to Internet communications. And so there's been just even in the chat bot cases, right? Anybody with a website that's got chat functionality enabled, there's been over 100 of those cases filed in the last year, right? And for the most part, they're all being filed by the same two firms, right? Just prolifically cutting and pasting and filing the same, um, the same case. And interestingly, you know, Scott Farrell at the Pacific Trial Attorneys has been using what the courts call a professional plaintiff, right? So he'll have a plaintiff go out and visit your website for the sole purpose of getting standing to sue in a, in a litigation. 
not to use your services, not because they're interested in what's going on out there. But you know, it's it's pretty it's pretty difficult when you're talking about having to navigate legitimate consumer interfacing marketing or um, you know business for profit transactions, and now you have to market again. <laughs> now you have to worry about the professional litigants that are out there. There's a couple good case examples on this slide, and hopefully you'll be receiving this after, where you know Bethany and her team and her peers have been really winning these cases. Um, on various arguments, including personal jurisdiction, the fact that you're a party to the conversation. How can you eavesdrop on your own conversation, right? That's the sense of it. No interception um, of the communication and transit, then an additional uh, you know, service provider exemptions and what have you. The key takeaway here is that this is a trend that's not going away, even though that we've been winning some of these more often than not because there are significant statutory penalties and sometimes the plaintiffs can even file these in individual capacities. Please go ahead, Cassie. BIPA, right? I mean, I can't believe I'm still talking about BIPA. And indeed in 2023, we're still gonna be talking hot and heavy about BIPA. For those that aren't familiar, it's basically biometric tracking, which happens to almost anybody who collects biometric data specifically on their employees where we're seeing pretty rich environment. And in 2023, the Illinois Supreme Court's not doing the defense bar any favors. The two main um, cases that have come out are that the five-year statute of limitation applies um, to violations of all sections. So great, it doesn't go back forever, but five years to look back is pretty significant with statutory penalties here. And, uh, you know, the other opinion, the White Castle opinion, that the claims accrue with each collection or disclosure of the biometric data. That is expanding li liability and exposure, not decreasing it. You know, of course, one silver lining, because I'm trying to see the silver lining in all of these trends, is that the major trial verdict that we saw this year for over $200 million, this is in the BNSF case, is going to be set for a new trial because of the discretionary standard. So there's still hope that we can uh, walk that one back as well. Please go ahead, Cassie. So VIPA, the Video Privacy Protection Statutes, are, are almost slowing down. On the slide here, so again, to back up, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Video Protection, uh, Video Privacy Protection Act, it is a, another one of these acts that was meant to view your, uh, meant to protect your viewing history, right? I mean, back when people went to Blockbuster, and now that's being extrapolated to anytime you, you have a, uh, a retail client that collects information on subscribing to magazines, on viewing videos, right? And the latest is that's being extended to if you have live streaming on your on your internet website, right? So if you have videos that clients can click on on your website, you have a risk of this type of statute and you need to pay attention closely. The good news is, I, I guess I'll start with the bad news. Early, we weren't seeing courts kick these in early 2023 and in 2022, and it was making us nervous. But I'm happy to report and list it on this slide, certainly in California and in Illinois, um, even one in Tennessee, where there's been recent wins, right? Where the courts are saying, you know, this is nonsense. Just because I put a video on my website and a consumer goes ahead and clicks it, you're not really capturing any sort of confidential uh, video information. So this is just something to look forward to, but I'm really hoping the trend of us crushing these cases continues. Please go ahead, Cassie. So what's next, right? I mean, we're all, we all learn about these new terms um, as they come up when we're talking about new applications of technology to old common law claims or old statutory violations, right? The latest trend, I'm, I don't know yet, but we're, predict we're trying to figure out if this is going to be the latest kind of SIPA, the latest cut and paste complaint that comes out. And we're calling them de-anonymizing. The plaintiffs call them doxing, right? For those of you who are unfamiliar, doxing is just taking somebody's personal information and making it private online. Online, right, collecting information about them from various sources and making it available online. You know, doxing became popular when they talked about doing it to celebrities and that making it unfair and what have you. So now that concept has been changed to being concerns about being de-anonymized. What does that even mean, right? It means when a user signs up for a browsing experience and they intentionally click to be anonymized when they're, when they're searching on the web right? Then that means the owner of the website has limited amounts of information about a browsing history in an anonymized fashion. But when you pair it with publicly and commercially available information in what's being called the quote unquote gray market, it allows me to create a profile about that user, even though they originally uh, intended to be searching anonymously. 
So who's being targeted and do you guys have to worry about this? Again, I would love to say these theories are ridiculous, but sometimes they do have legs. And we've seen over a dozen of these being filed just in 2023, and I haven't personally seen any motions to dismiss um, yet. Uh, rulings yet on this that can give us some guidance, but it is something that everybody here on this uh, presentation today should be aware of. If you're collecting information on, on the browsing history through the pixel or any sort of cookie tracking, um, you know, technology, and there's a either a consent or an intentional allowance of anonymized browsing, and then through some quote unquote back door, it allows you to de-anonymize, there's a risk there. And with 5K per penalty under these, some of these very scary California statutes, it's something that we should all uh, take note of. Last slide, Cassie. So again, my prediction is, Data breach litigation is not going away. The existing privacy statute litigation is not going away. And the, pla the plaintiffs, and I got to give them credit for their creativity, are always coming up with new hooks in order to extend old laws into do new technology platforms. But everybody's at risk. We're here to help you if ever you need anything. And I really appreciate everybody's time today. Hi, everybody. For anybody who missed the very beginning of this presentation, I'm Julie Brady, the co-leader of Baker's Class Action Defense Team, and I'm housed in the Orlando office. Uh, during the 2022 Year in Review webinar in January, I addressed what the U.S. Supreme Court may take up in 2023 and what we may expect out of the appellate courts. So I wanted to look back at some of those thoughts. First, incentive awards, which I have addressed in the last several webinars. Following the 11th Circuit's determination that incentive awards are per se unlawful and other circuits and district courts position since the 11th Circuit's prohibition, which for the most part is directly at odds with the 11th Circuit's holding, it appeared that the question as to whether incentive payments were per se illegal was teed up to be addressed by the US Supreme Court. However, the court declined review in April. Another issue which seemed ripe for review based on a several decisions in 2022 from the appellate courts were in the courts question the appropriateness of Cypre awards and specifically and in what circumstances a court may approve a settlement as fair, reasonable and adequate when there was a Cypre award to be paid from the settlement fund for any unclaimed funds. But with two petitions for cert on this issue, the US Supreme Court court also declined review of this issue. And then in October of 2022, after the Ninth Circuit questioned the appropriateness of an aggregate statutory damages award of $925 million in a TCPA case and mentioned and stated that an aggregate statutory award, even if the statutory damages award in and of itself per violation was not an issue, an aggregated, an aggregated statutory damage awards could be subject to constitutional due process challenges when the aggregate was gravely disproportionate to the legal violations committed. We expected other district courts, to, the circuit courts to follow suit. It does not appear that any have to date. And finally, in January 2023, I also queried whether federal courts would continue to closely scrutinize class action settlements. And the answer to that is a resounding yes. So I will start with some recent circuit court decisions on class action settlements. In April, the 11th Circuit vacated a class action settlement approved by the district court that included injunctive relief and damages because the district court did not first determine whether any of the named plaintiffs had standing to pursue injunctive relief. There, consumers brought a class action against the manufacturer of brain performance supplements, alleging the advertising and product labeling used false and misleading statements to give consumers the impression that the supplement had been clinically proven to improve brain function. The parties reached a settlement for injunctive relief and up to $8 million in monetary relief. And there, the question of standing wasn't even raised in the appeal that an objector brought forth challenging the settlement. Rather, the 11th Circuit, sous sponte, raised standing and concluded that the named plaintiffs lacked standing to pursue claims for injunctive relief because none of them alleged that they planned to purchase any of the products in the future 
so as to subject them to a threat of real and immediate harm. In fact, the court pointed out that they alleged that the product was worthless, showing the fact that they were unlikely to purchase it again. Thus, the 11th Circuit determined that the district court lacked jurisdiction to award appropriate injunctive relief and that the approval of the settlement was an abuse of discretion because standing must be separately established for every form of relief sought. So even though there was standing for the damages, there was no standing for the injunctive relief. And as a side note, and as clear by the prior presentations, standing is and remains to be a hot topic we are actually seeing a recent pattern of courts, um, even outside of the settlement context, challenging or addressing and raising standing at the motion to dismiss stage. We're seeing a number of courts directing the parties to brief standing um, when a motion to dismiss is pending, even if the defendants have not challenged Article III standing, oftentimes because defendants prefer to proceed in federal court. Um, another hot topic um, that the appellate courts continue to address is coupon settlements and attorney's fees, and in short, a coupon by any other name is still a coupon. Um, despite creative names to call them anything other than coupons, courts are weary of settlements which provide class members free or discounted products or services of the defendant. Um, the Cir Second Circuit addressed this in August in a case involving the New York Times, where the Second Circuit vacated a settlement between the New York Times and a class of California readers who were automatically charged renewal fees when the settlement provided for either access codes for a one-month subscription or pro rata class payments. Um, the court made a particular fact of the of the fact that the access cord codes could not be used for an existing subscription or to extend a current description, but could only be used for no, new subscriptions, therefore requiring a party, a, a class member to actually take on a new subscription. Um, so therefore, the Second Circuit held that the access codes were indeed coupons and therefore attorney's fees must be calculated based on CAFA's coupon settlement provision and not the face value of the access codes with the court noting that this was disfavored situations where the attorneys get cash and the class just gets coupons. Next slide. Uh, another um, type of settlement we are seeing more and more resistance from the courts are claims made settlements um, and challenges to awards of attorney's fees based upon the amount of a cap on the claims. Uh, just last month, the Ninth Circuit reversed a class action settlement and remanded it to the district court to justify any attorney fee award to the, uh, to the attorneys. In Lowry versus Rhapsody, a class action was brought on behalf of copyright holders of musical compositions against a company that offered music for digital streaming. And there, the settlement provided that the company would pay class members for musical compositions based on its streaming service, streaming service and set a cap of $20 million, upon which it, the attorneys based their request for a fees award. Um, the Ninth Circuit would later refer to this cap as illusory with no meaningful monetary relief to the class because even though the settlement provided for a form of injunctive relief, that, injunctive, that form of injunctive relief had already been addressed in recent amendments to the law. Um, ultimately, only $52,000 was paid out to the class, yet class counsel sought $6 million in fees and was ultimately awarded $1.7 million, which the Ninth Circuit noted was more than 20 times the amount received by the class. Um, the Ninth Circuit did not mince words expressing its disfavor for the settlement um, and noted that class counsel harbored little realistic probability that they would re recover substantial compensation for the class. And notably there, the court disregarded the amount of time spent by counsel, stating that it didn't matter if counsel spent hundreds or thousands of hours if they were just spinning their wheels without any relief to the class. And the court held that courts must consider the actual or realistically anticipated benefits of the class, not the maximum or hypothetical amount in assessing the value of a class action settlement. And the court noted that any other approach 
would allow the parties to, quote, concoct a high phantom settlement cap to justify the fee. And so what we're seeing is a trend in attorney's fees coming under scrutiny, if not commensurate with the relief ultimately provided to the class. And along those same lines, another type of fee coming under scrutiny, perhaps not to the extent of the 11th Circuit that has prohibited incentive awards, is incentive awards that don't correlate to the relief to the class. In March, the Second Circuit affirmed a $5.6 billion antitrust class action brought by numerous merchants against credit card issuing networks and banks and approved the settlement in full except with respect to a $900,000 in service awards to the eight named plaintiffs. The court noted that most of the work that the lead plaintiffs performed was geared toward obtaining legislative reform for the injunction class and that those efforts should be excluded in de determining a service award to the damages class. In other words, the court held that the class should not have to pay for time spent lobbying for changes in the law that do not benefit to them. The case, the Second Circuit therefore remanded the case to the district court to keep the five $5.6 billion settlement in place, but address the appropriate incentive award for the relief that was afforded to the class. Um, harping back to the proprietary of uh, incentive awards, the court did note that service awards are likely impermissible under Supreme Court practice, but su Supreme Court precedent, but practice and usage seem to have superseded this precedent. So what does this close scrutiny by the federal courts um, mean in, in practice? Um, it may cause defendants to give more consideration to seeking removal to federal court if the parties believe a settlement is likely or in their best interests. Um, it may cause parties to discuss certain and consider where to um, you know, effectuate a proper settlement if they have concerns about any of these issues. Now, outside of the class action settlement context, no class action presentation is complete without addressing, oh, I'm sorry, next slide, please. Outside of the cl class action settlement arena, a long awaited decision from the Supreme Court on personal jur jurisdiction, you know, most corporations doing businesses in states other than their state of incorporation or their principal place of business were monitoring the U.S. Supreme Court's consideration as to whether the due process clause of the 14th Amendment prohibits a state from requiring an out-of-state corporation to consent to personal jurisdiction to do business in that state. And the Mallory decision was based on a Pennsylvania consent statute which provides that an out-of-state corporation may not do business in Pennsylvania unless it registers with the Department of State, but by registering with the Department of State, that corporation consents to general personal jurisdiction in Pennsylvania. So basically they consent to being subject to any type of lawsuit in Pennsylvania. Now Mallory concerned a former mechanic for the railway who was residing in Virginia at the time he brought a suit. He brought the suit against the railway, which was his former employer, for negligence after he was diagnosed with cancer, which he said was caused by carcinogens while he was working. The railway was incorporated in Virginia with its principal place of Virginia. And the cause of action, the exposure to the carcinogens occurred in Ohio and Virginia. So very little ties to Pennsylvania other than the fact that the railway ran through Pennsylvania and had um, stops in Pennsylvania. Um, after the case reached the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court held that the Pennsylvania consent statute violates the due process clause, which was a decision at odds with the Georgia Supreme Court who had recently rejected such a contention and found there was not, no violation leading to the U.S. Supreme Court accepting, re accepting review. The decision largely focused on a, um, the International Shoe versus Washington case, which is a U.S. Supreme Court case from 1945 that is in every law school first year constitutional law textbook, 
which provides that a corporation is subject to general personal jurisdiction, which means subjects to all kinds of suits against it in states where the corporation is headquartered or has its principal place of business. The railway relied on international shoe to argue it could not be subjected to general personal jurisdiction in Pennsylvania simply because it was registered to be, do business there. The U.S. Supreme Court held that while the railway was trying to use international shoe to limit jurisdiction, in reality, international shoe only, quote, staked out an additional ground to jurisdiction when the corporation, corporate defendant did not, had not consented to suit in the forum. But here, the U.S. Supreme Court found that the railway had consented to suit in the forum by registering to do to by registering with the Department of State, even though such registration was a requirement to do business. The court focused on the fact that consent could be expressed or implied and manifested in various ways by word or deed. Um, the Supreme Court pointed out that it had actually resolved this same question more than a century ago. But it will be interesting to see if corporations are finding themselves subject to suits in states where they are not incorporated, don't have their principal place in business, and have very little ties to the action simply because they've had to register to do business there. There are about a dozen, suit, a dozen states that have consent statutes, albeit of varying degrees, um, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens in that context. I did want to note that in a separate concurrence, Judge Alito questioned whether the statute violated the Dormant Commerce Clause, um, which prohibits state laws that unduly restrict interstate commerce, perhaps leaving the door open to another constitutional challenge. And finally, next slide. Arbitration. No class action presentation is complete without addressing the arbitration decisions. In a June decision welcomed by many corporate defendants, the US Supreme Court held that a district court must stay its proceedings during an interlocutory appeal on the question of arbitrability. And the court premised this holding on the Griggs principle, which is the concept and the rule that an interlocutory appeal divests the district court of its control over those aspects of the case involved in the appeal. And applying this principle, the court recognized that because the question on appeal is whether the case belongs in arbitration or instead in the district court, the entire case is essentially involved in the appeal. And the court recognized that staying district court proceedings reflects common sense, which it does because to require parties to engage in pretrial and even trial proceedings while the appeal on the arbitrability of the dispute is ongoing um, results in a loss of many of the benefits for moving to compel an arbitration in the first place, efficiency, less expense, and less intrusive discovery. Um, and in response to the challenge that not automatically staying district court proceedings would result in frivolous appeals, the court noted that district courts have robust tools to prevent delay and deter frivolous interlocutory appeals. Um, and then wrapping up, in 2023, there were a number of decisions out of the Ninth Circuit on arbitration. I will briefly touch on one. In February, the Ninth Circuit found that the Federal Arbitration Act preempts a California statute that makes it a criminal offense for an employer to enter into a contract that includes non-negotiable terms, including requiring an employee to waive any right, forum, or procedure for a violation of the California Labor Code, which includes the right to file and pursue a civil action. Notably, the, the statute itself did not preclude arbitration, but by, it, by requiring employees to waive their right to file suit, and in effect, it did so. Interesting there to avoid preemption, the statute only criminalized contract formation, um, an arbitration agreement that was executed in violation of the law was enforceable, which obviously presents a um, unique and interesting challenge. Um, but the court, uh, the Ninth Circuit held that the preemption applied because the statute treated arbitration agreements differently from other contracts. 
and held that the FAA preempts a state statute that discriminates against arbitration by discouraging or prohibiting the formation of an arbitration agreement. So it focused on the formation and not just the enforcement, recognizing that obstacle preemption rendered this statute um, unlawful. And with that, I will turn it back over to Bethany to close out the, pro the program. Thanks, Julie. Um, uh, Julie ended with arbitration, which I think there was a question from the audience that we really weren't able to address, which was mass arbitration. Um, we're dealing with lots of um, uh, clients who are interested in looking at their terms and conditions um, because they have been subject to um, threats of mass arbitration or mass arbitration or individual arbitrations and are concerned about mass arbitration. So we're happy to follow up with anybody that has questions in that area. Um, it is a uh, really developing area that um, closely intersects with class actions. So we'll be um, following that closely, and hopefully in the end of year, we can report back on some additional findings in that space. So we have one last CLE code, um, which is homecoming court um, for those of you that uh, are applying for CLE. And this concludes our program. Uh, we hope you'll join us again as we bring you up to date at the year end or early 2024 on the class action developments through the end of the year. For those who want CLE credit, please stick around for the post webinar survey. Um, you'll be asked for your bar number, CLE codes given during the presentation. And of course, if you have any questions regarding CLE, please email Cassie Blaine at bakerlaw.com and her email address is C B 